I'm Chris Evans, Extension Forester with the University of Illinois, and we're looking here at emerald ash borer. If you're not familiar with emerald ash borer, it is an invasive insect that has moved into Illinois. Uh, here in southern Illinois, it's been about five years, and it attacks our ash trees. So we have four different species of ash tree down here, and the problem is our native ash really have no resistance to this insect. And so what we're seeing is a lot of mortality, a lot of the ash are just dying from this insect feeding on them. Um, it's a hazard for us because um, that as the ash die, they become a risk for falling down. We're also losing the species out of our ecosystems. So I'm beside an ash tree here that has died from emerald ash borer. So it shows kind of some of the symptoms that you see commonly with emerald ash borer. And up, up here close where the bark is falling off, you can actually see the little galleries. So that's where the little larvae of the ash borer have been feeding. And so they get just under the, the bark and they make these kind of snaking, uh, uh, sinuous galleries and they eat that inner bark layer, that cambial layer. And over time, this basically just girdles the whole tree, starves it of nutrients uh, and eventually kills it. And this is really visible here. You can see there's multiple other places where this is happening. As the tree dies, um, the bark separates from the inner part of the tree and you get this really loose bark that peels back like this. And so just peeling it back, you can see more of those galleries. Um, and so that's another sign for emerald ash borer is loose peeling bark um, like this, especially when they're in the advanced stage. In the smaller branches where the bark is thinner and that's usually higher in the tree, um, you'll see exit holes. So as the, the larvae, when they finish um, feeding, they get large enough, they'll pupate under the bark and turn into an adult and then the adult chews its way out uh, of the tree. And they do that, they make a little little tiny, we call an exit hole, that's a clean D shape. So it's flat on one side and rounded on the other. And the reason why is the, the, the adults themselves have a flat head too. So it's kind of mimics the shape of their head, but it's really, really noticeable on those smaller branches. It's a really clean kind of capital D shaped exit hole. And that's usually the, one of the first signs you see for a emerald ash borer, even before you see a lot of this advanced stage problems. Another sign for emerald ash borer is heavy woodpecker feeding. Woodpeckers will key in on uh, the fact that there's a lot of these larvae under the bark and they'll start focusing on ash trees. So if you see a lot of this um, bark being sloughed off like this, it's called blonding or flecking. That's a good sign. And then all of these ragged holes here, that's actually woodpecker feeding holes where they burrowed through the bark to eat the emerald ash borer larvae. And trees that are kind of in that advanced stage of infestation, they're at the close to the point of dying. This is a very common, you'll see this through them. And, that, and that's one of the things we key in on when we look for uh, emerald ash borer is this flecking and all these little woodpecker holes. So this is another sign of emerald ash borer that you'll commonly see, and it's usually one of the first ones um, to kind of clue in on that your tree's in trouble, and it's this, ep we call it epicormal sprouting. It's all these small diameter um, little branches that come out of the bigger branches. It's basically the tree is, as the ash borer is chewing through the tree and kind of depriving it of nutrients, um, it's the tree's effort to try to get more nutrients out there, get more photosynthetic capacity. So it's putting up a whole lot more branches, just trying to get the, what it needs to, to survive, get more energy. And um, it, usually this is kind of, once we see this within a year or two, this tree's gonna drop, um, drop down and probably die in a few years. There's not a lot you can do on a large scale to get rid of emerald ash borer. Um, if you have a lot of ash in your forest, that's pretty much gonna go through there and you're gonna expect to lose it. But if you do have, you know, an ash tree in your yard um, or someone that's or a tree that's really special to you or something that's a, a centerpiece of your landscaping or whatever, the way that or the tree that you want to keep, there are some things you can do to keep emerald ash borer out of those trees as long as you do it early enough before the trees really starting to be impacted and it's pesticides. So you can put um, either a soil drench or an injection and you Put this systemic pesticide in there that will kill the ash borers. The problem is it only lasts for one to three years depending on the chemicals you use so you have to repeat it but it's very effective at keeping emerald ash borer out of your ash trees 
and keeping your ash trees healthy as long as um, it's not too advanced already. If it's, it's in a bad state, you're already seeing a lot of decline or dieback, then you're probably too late. But catch it early and you can save a tree uh, from emerald ash borer. But again, it's a repeated treatment kind of thing. We are starting to kind of research ash now here down at the Ag Center and throughout Southern Illinois. And we're trying to get a better sense of how fast these trees start to break down and how fast they become a hazard. Um, so we're, we're looking at, uh, we've, we're trapping emerald ash borer, surveying for it throughout the southern 11 counties, and we're monitoring trees over five years to kind of see their rate of decline and how quick they become hazardous. Um, and the idea would be that we, we know um, when we have to implement management strategies, how long we have to afterwards, just some better ideas for managers to know kind of how to respond to emerald ash borer. So the, the one good thing about emerald ash borer is it really is restricted just to ash trees. So um, other species, you know, it's not gonna move over to maples or to oaks or anything like that. Um, ash is an important part of our ecosystems. We have an estimated close to 150 million ash trees in Illinois. So uh, it, it is going to be a big impact, but luckily it's really restricted just to those trees. We don't see it moving in Illinois to any other species. Hello everyone and welcome to Facebook Live with the Horticulturists. We are the Horticulturists here to answer your gardening questions. Uh, my name is Candace Hart. I'm the State Master Gardener Specialist here for UVI Extension and I'm based here in Bloomington that just got a whole bunch of rain this weekend. Uh, we are excited today to have a really special guest with us. So we're going to have her introduce herself here in a little bit. But Kelly, Ryan, you want to introduce yourselves as our horticulturist today? Hi everyone, my name is Kelly Alsip. I am also a horticulture educator for University of Illinois Extension and my specialty is integrated pest management. However, I spend more time um, talking about conserving insects than I do about killing them. So uh, I'm making up for it, I'm making up for it. So I'm the insect lady. I've been called the bug lady, the butterfly lady, every kind of bug lady probably I've been called. Nice. Yeah. And I'm Ryan Panikaw, horticulture educator out of Champaign, uh, Urbana. Uh, and my specialty is kind of trees and shrubs, woody plants, all that kind of stuff. I like native plants and I'm a big vegetable gardener. It's kind of my other kind of side gig to the other areas of horticulture I'm interested in. But we have a special guest today. So Amanda, I'd love, love it if you could introduce yourself to our audience and tell us a little bit about yourself. I am Amanda Thompson, the author of Kiss My Aster, which is a long-running garden blog and uh, the only choose-your-own-adventure book of home landscaping. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Love it. Okay, so if you guys have questions specifically for uh, Amanda, we're going to have her on for kind of the beginning of our show. So definitely add those to the comment box and we'll get to those and any other gardening questions we'll get to today as well. But we're so glad to have you. Um, and I think we're just going to start off just kind of asking you some questions to yeah. get a little bit about kind of your style of gardening and, and what you think. So Kelly, you want to 
Head us off. Yeah, Amanda, you have a really unique um, philosophy to gardening, adding in a lot of artistic appeal and whimsical, kind of like the rule breaker of gardening. Um, where did you develop this philosophy and um, uh, how, how, how should other people be, express it along with you? Um, I think for me, I kind of was like this punk rock girl in high school. And I mean, who am I kidding? I still am. Uh, it's just really knowing who I am and being that person indoors, the clothes that I wear, and then, you know, being that person outdoors and um, whether or not my neighbors appreciate it or not, but just really kind of knowing who I am and doing what makes me happy. It's my house, my property, my property taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to do whatever makes me, when I pull in the driveway, I have a big smile on my face. So what have you recently done that has made you really happy in your yard? Uh, right now, it's just kind of reclaiming spaces from the weeds. Um, I am kind of working backwards after living in this house for eight or nine years. All my perennials have uh, gotten as big as possible. My natives are seeding out where I have um, maybe too much solidago, maybe too many asters. I don't know if that's possible. And I'm just kind of trying to tidy and edit and reclaim things. And that does actually make me really happy. Um, a a short-term project on my list is I have this beautiful um, chandelier that a friend gave me hanging above my outdoor dining set. But the little candle, um, like for the electricity, is there's nothing there. It's like a little, you know, a little empty spot. And I bought tiny little disco balls to glue up there. So I've got that on my uh, my short range plans, and that's really delighting me. Honestly, I can't wait to do that. I'm waiting for the storms to kind of subside before I start messing with glue on a ladder. Right. Yeah. I mean, disco balls in the garden. That sounds like an excellent trend. It's excellent. The way it reflects the light is just fantastic. What color, what color, what color of plants go well with disco balls? You're asking that question wrong. What color plant does not go yeah, well with disco balls? Okay, <laughs> wonderful. One of the, one of the, the, when I saw your presentation, it was, uh, you had, uh, you were using things like forks and you were using reclaimed items and there was even a toilet in there and it was just this fun, like really kind of kooky idea. Um, it, do you always um, use reclaimed items when you're in, trying to incorporate that art into your garden? Absolutely. Uh, I'm working on, I bet I've tried a couple times, like, for, like, this is, since I work in the garden on my own um, and it's my quiet time, I try to do things sometimes several times before I get it to work out. My husband bought me some lovely um, eight to 10 foot tall church organ pipes, pipe organ pipes. Oh, cool. And I've tried setting those in my garden a bunch of times really unsuccessfully, which is hilarious when they hit the house. <laughs> um, so I'm uh, working on, you know, digging post hole with a post hole diggers, digging the holes out and then um, using rebar and the, the bangy anything, mm -hmm. which, you know, it's hard to buy the bangy anything when you don't really know the name <laughs> and then uh, getting those set in. Um, so that's another, another thing I've been working on is resetting those. Um, I have a mannequin that I move around the yard. I have a big uh, a tattoo shack that was a, a, at a street festival um, that we, it's kind of like a puppet theater. We've got all kinds of things. And um, it's fun to, to break up. I have a lot of plants. I have a lot of intensive plantings. It's fun to use these items to kind of oddly draw the eye to the plants. I mean, it's, it's, there's only so long that you can look at a mannequin, but it makes you curious about what's going on over there and, and want to be a little bit curious about that area. Do you find some of the people in your neighborhood use some of your interesting techniques in their own yard? I have, I have seen, I don't know if you're familiar with the, um, there's a children's book called The Big Orange Plot by Daniel Pinkwater. Um, it's a really the only book that you need on landscaping. It's not about landscaping at all. It's about <laughs> a seagull drops a can of orange paint on Mr. Plumbeam's, uh, his roof. And his neighbors get together with him and say, Mr. Plumbeam, this is a neat street. We don't do things like this. We need you to fix this right away. And instead of fixing it, he paints his house all the colors 
and says, I am me and my house is me and I am, I will do what I please in this space. And uh, eventually he talks all his neighbors into kind of going out on that limb as well. Um, I have seen some cool things happening on my street where they were very resistant for a really long time. I'm seeing a little bit of softening. I have noticed um, uh, when I'm converting an area of lawn into a bed, I have a terrible habit of just digging a hole in the lawn and just shoving a plant in there and then doing sheet mulching out and out and out. And I've noticed... um, that the neighbors at first were really questioning the plants just kind of sticking in the middle of my lawn. And now they're like, I'm seeing a little bit of sheet mulching. I'm seeing a little bit of plants in the middle of the lawn becoming something. Um, I think that there is a mindset that, um, you know, maybe it's just the difference between gardening and landscaping. Uh, People tend to want things done. They want to see it and have it be done. Whereas I look at my yard my garden and everything I do in life really is just a a process to keep me off the streets and to keep me out of trouble. And um, I have long range plans, but I don't really care how fast I get there. And uh, that really irritates some neighbors, some people, they just want it done. Like I'm going to buy these plants. I'm going to get this bed in. I'm going to get it all done. And how much fun you're really yanking out from your own life when you need to do things that way. Um, when things come together in little dribs and drabs, it's, it's fun. It's, it's, you have to have some tolerance for, for not having things come together quickly, but, um, they come together well, maybe not quickly, but well. Uh, I think that is a wonderful, wonderful philosophy to have, um, you know, I mean, I'm all, I'm all about experimentation and to to not take it, you know, so seriously and and to think that you know gardening is you know going to be something we do every day for the rest of our lives and it's not like this project that gets completed, right? Candace is your yeah. Partner? I've always I've always thought that too because I feel like I'm kind of a plant collector and I'm sure you are, Amanda, too. It's like you're not going to have a landscape of three of this and five of this and kind of these large groupings of, of really uh, thought out plantings necessarily. But every time I go to the garden center, I see a new plant that I want to try. And I'm like, well, I got to, I got to try it. So there's always something new adding in and moving around. And I've always thought that same thing. It's like, it's never done. You're always changing something, which absolutely. I think. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. Are, are you like that, Amanda? Do you go to the garden center and buy plants that you don't know where you're going to put them? <laughs> uh, not as often as I used to. I, I really was that person who had a pile of plants in the driveway, you know, that would they would overwinter. And uh, <laughs> that was me for a really long time. And I've kind of cut back on that. So um because it was, it, it gave me guilt. I, I felt a little guilty. So I've cut back. I've become a little bit more practical in my plant buying. And I don't go to the garden center as much as I used to. Oh, I know that. That's the key. You got to resist the temptation. Just not go. Well, I mean, <laughs> let's, let's state I have over an acre and yeah. a lot of gardens. So frequently, everything I need is already in my yard. True. Divide yeah. it, and move around. Yeah. 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 Love so, um, you know, for all of us gardeners out there, we're always, you know, want, looking for the perfect plants and looking for the best in the landscape. Give us a couple of plants that you are just, you love and you cannot live without in your garden that we should also be growing in our gardens. I am obsessed with um, Diablo Nine Bark, which is, you know, nothing cutting edge by any means, but I am obsessed with privacy So I am, even though I'm a perennials girl at heart, I really have developed a romance with shrubs this last year or two, kind of going back to basics because uh, what's the point if you don't have a great um, background, you know, like a desktop background, you make everything, uh, to make everything work. And it's what a tough plant. I mean, you have to do nothing. It looks great. Every plant that you put in front of it is more in the spotlight. Um, it's when it's covered with white flowers, it, it bloomed this year and last year, as, as far as I can think back at the same time as my roses. And I have it combined with some really tall white roses and some, um, some other roses in front of it that just really uh, look great in front of those, those cool purplish brown leaves. 
Um, what else am I obsessed with? I'm obsessed with Aramaris, so foxtail lilies. I have three or four different kinds in my yard, and they're really the the traffic stoppers in my neighborhood. Um, I have I, I have a massive vegetable garden. Everything there uh, freaks me out. I if it's weird, I want to grow it. I've decided, you know, I don't know why I need to grow two kinds of sorghum. I don't know. I couldn't tell you. Am I going to do anything with the sorghum? No, I'm not. <laughs> um, but I, I like big plants and I'm going to grow it. So um, let's see. What else am I obsessed with? I mean, I'm just, I get obsessed with everything. Um, <laughs> it, it's not uh, difficult for me to just, you know, get really excited and, you um, and I don't have to have fancy plants. I get as excited about like a cheap corkscrew willow as I do a, like a nice coral bark maple, which I mean really tells you a lot about me. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I think we kind of agree. Um, Ryan is obsessed with native shrubs right now. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And the that goes back to the native uh, gardening that you're talking about, you know, there's this, you know, hot, this this idea that we want to, you know, plant all these natives, plant all these natives, and then we see that these natives don't look the way that, you know, I think every gardener, you know, not every gardener, but every non-gardener right. has this image of what yeah. uh, uh, a garden should look like. So yeah. if you are planting natives, what 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 should you know about planting natives? Well, I mean, it's definitely a look. Uh, and right now, you know, you'd have your coneflowers, grasses are looking great. Um, the natives in my yard that look fantastic right now, my mountain mint is a plant that everyone should have. It's super cool. Um, I think it has a cool look. It's not very showy, but the pollinators are going freaky on it. And um, I think it's a kind of sophisticated looking native, which aren't they don't sophisticated and native eh, i don't know um <laughs> natives to me are, tend to be a little on the on the fuzzy side is it maybe like that's a texture it's uh -huh. they I, I'm, maybe i'm a little off on that but the but when you team them with the grasses it works um another native i have that's looking really good right now is wild quinine what a winner that's a native right it is yeah. i think so, yeah, yeah. um I struggle because I have a very uh, space age, mid-century ranch. So I believe that landscaping should have some callback to the style of your home. And um, I've lived in homes that were a little bit more nondescript in the past. And you could kind of go a little bit more, um, I would say wild with landscaping. But I feel like this has to have a little bit more of a, of a look to it, a little bit more mid-century. Cool. Okay, we've gotten some audience questions for you, Amanda. So I'm going to check on those here. Um, Jennifer asks, what does Amanda start with first when she's thinking about a new project? So where do you start first with a new That's project? That's a great question. When I um, it, And it's hard for me. I've tried to teach design in the past, and it's something like, uh, I think it's in your brain. Either I don't know. It, either it's easy for you or it's just super, super hard. Mm -hmm. I go to someone's house, and I almost and this sounds a little hokey, I almost hear like a little voice that says, here is what's right for this house. Mm -hmm. um, the, the traditional landscaping basics are that you add some height, you add something evergreen, and then you fill in with color. And then you want to make sure that your color is balanced throughout the, at least the three normal seasons. And then there's winter. I'm terrible at winter, um, winter interest. It's, it's like, I'm not interested, quite honestly, in anything outside or indoors all winter. Just <laughs> let me sleep. Let me hibernate. Um, so the first thing you want to look at is like your hero plants, the plants that when you pull in the driveway or when you're looking out your front door, the ones that make you really smile, that's where you, the money goes. That's where um, the effort goes is those few plants that are really... Um, you know, they're not necessarily for someone who's pulling in your driveway other than you, but mm -hmm. that is pro it's probably, if someone who's coming to your house likes you, then they're <laughs> going to like your plants too. So um, you're going to want to to look for something tall to balance out um, the, top, the height of your house. And then uh, look for a little bit of evergreen, which is not, again, my favorite. And then look for color or something that's going to be interesting all year round. 
Love it. Even if it's a mannequin. <laughs> bring, yeah, bring in some color with some props and things like yep. that, right? <laughs> okay, Erin asks, um, what are your top tips for beginning gardeners to get started and not become overwhelmed? That's, you know, starting small um, and then understanding that horticulturists kill plants all day long, every Wait. day. All day long, every day. That's what we do. We're basically paid to kill plants and to gain, but we get paid for it. We gain the knowledge for it. We don't feel bad about it because we know that this is just how things go. Um, You know, uh, to keep trying. My thing that I always say, and I've said it probably too many times, it's like if you break a glass, taking it out of the dishwasher, you don't say, that's it. I'm never (laughs) drinking water again. That's it. I'm done. (laughs) Um, where people are like, oh, I killed something, you know, I tried to grow corn in a shoebox and it didn't grow. And that's it. I'm never, I don't, I can't do this. Of course you can do this. We are all two or three generations from where we had to do this. This was the only way to go. So yeah, it's, you know how to do it. If you can get real quiet and kind of listen to the little voice in your brain, about what what's going to work and what isn't. I, I think every every new gardener can do this. And also, don't pay attention to everything you see on the internet. Pay attention to what's in the little voice in your brain. Good tip. Yes, I just read your last article about getting horticulture information on the internet and how. Oh, I forgot uh, that's out already. Yeah, how, how you uh, you know how. And it happens to, you know, Candace Ryan and I, while well, somebody will ask a really simple question that they probably could have Googled, but you talk about how there's a lot of misinformation out there. So how places like Extension are important in gardening. So can you elaborate on that a little bit? Um, well, the, the thing is, so the people in garden centers now, customers are coming into garden centers and they... Uh, see something or learn something on the internet that is a probably clickbait. So right now people are inundated with pictures of rainbow hostas and glittery roses and uh, purple Japanese maples. And you send your $2 away and you get, you know, it's ultimately like apple seeds or something like that in the mail (laughs) months later from China. And then there, there are people who just won't back down. Well, I saw it on the internet. And if you don't have this rainbow um, Japanese maple, you suck. You're not doing your job right. And it, that's just, uh, that's such a hard, working in a garden center is such a hard job. Mm. Um, you know, these are people who ultimately have a ton of knowledge. They work super hard for a few months of the year. They don't get to spend time in their own gardens because they're helping people, you know, learn and, and get things going on, the, on their own. And then they have to battle with people who are like, well, I saw this thing on the in on the internet. It must be true. The people in garden centers have an immense amount of knowledge, practical knowledge. Um, and they know what's great for your area. They know what's great for your personal soil, for your weather. And um, to have to go into this job every day where they're going to sweat 18 cubic yards of sweat and skip lunch because customers don't ever stop coming in the door. Um, they they deserve respect. They deserve to be listened to. They sh- should be, uh, I don't know, revered for their knowledge. And then uh, the article goes on to say also, some things are just bigger from the garden center and call the extension. <laughs> Um, yeah. Well, hey, um, hey, I used to be in the industry, Amanda. So um, I, the person with the watering wand and, and, you know, I personally, Amanda, it's your job to make sure you're growing, selling me things that I'm going to be successful at. And um, so you're also selling me being a successful gardener in the long run. And so uh, I'm sorry that they don't listen to you, but um, um, probably rainbow hosta is not really a thing, right? It is not really a thing, but there's so many people, they were like, I saw it on the internet. And so now now you're an idiot for not having these in your garden center. And that is happening out there to garden centers everywhere. Yeah, it's crazy. So is, um, it, how is the, uh, how have you, how have, 
how is garden centers? I know I, I feel like garden centers did really well during the pandemic because we we, did. Have, we bought some plants last year and you guys, you know, ran out of some plants. Um, how has um, the pandemic changed gardening? Well, uh, I mean, they've sold out of a lot of things. There's been soil shortages. There's been plant shortages. A lot of people had um, massive tropical plant shortages this spring. Um, I think that when it comes to perennials and trees and shrubs, they may have sold like the 2021's plants in 2020. And so today, these plants this year might be like the leftover 2021's and then maybe into 2020, maybe smaller plants, which I mean, ultimately not a huge deal. Um, I wonder if there's going to be a glut in the market in, in a few years down the road, but um, seed shortages, soil shortages, Pot, I, I apparently you can't get a terracotta pot to save your soul out there in the world. Um, it's been, it's been an interesting thing, but the, the key is that all these people that are new to gardening, that we can keep them in the fold. The garden centers have been praying for this for years. Now it's being able to accommodate all these people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Keep them around, keep them coming back yep. and in gardening. Yeah. And, you know, being able to scale up, it's like you, you know, having all your dreams come true under terrible circumstances yeah. is, is really, that's hard. It's still emotionally hard and physically hard. Yeah. So did the pandemic affect the horticulture industry um, through labor? Um, yeah. I mean, it's been, uh, people have been working around the clock to try to make things happen and try to, you know, again, people have been praying for this for a long time. And then to have these people show up, they've tried to give everyone a great experience, sell people what they're looking for. Um, sometimes you know, they're not always asking for things that are reasonable, um, but trying to make those things happen anyways has been a, a big deal. Yeah. Well, Amanda, I know we've about taken up the time you had available. Are there any kind of final thoughts you want to leave with our viewers out there? Gosh, I don't know. It's a beautiful day. Get out there. And um, this weather is super conducive. It, uh, you don't just have to buy things in May. Get out there and buy some stuff now. Garden centers have more time to spend with you. Things are a little less crazy. I feel like um, the stuff that they push out in May for the May shopping uh, customers is is just like push out, uh, stack it high and watch it fly. But the things that come in throughout the rest of the summer are sometimes more interesting or um, you're seeing something that maybe you wouldn't see if you are only an early shopper. So get out there in July, get out there in August. And this weather, with, and especially with the nonstop rain, has been great for putting new plants in the ground. So yeah. keep being curious and keep buying plants. Awesome. Thanks, Amanda. Can, do you want to let people know where they can find you if they want to kind of follow along with your gardening? Everything about me is at Kiss My Aster. Okay. <laughs> on, every, on every piece of social media, I am the only Kiss My Aster. <laughs> I love it. Wonderful name. Awesome. Wonderful yeah, name. it's perfect. Cool. Well, we really appreciate you hopping in, Amanda, and thanks for talking with us and answering those questions. And have a have a great rest of the day. Happy gardening. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yep. Hey, Amanda. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna stay on everybody and um, chat about kind of what we're up to in our gardens and catch up on your guys's questions because I know we've had some other kind of gardening questions come in. But how awesome was that? That was really cool. Love her. I know. I like the. Um... Um, I like the way she was like shrub, grass, fill in with color and then balance. It was like, mm -hmm. and then the hero plants. And I was like, hero plants. Do you mean like hydrangea? <laughs> <laughs> right. That's our, our always recommendation. <laughs> we love hydrangea on this show. You can't go wrong. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, if you guys still have questions, add those to the comment box. We're going to get to them um, today. But let me see. We had a question earlier, um, a follow-up on the Emerald Ash Borer video, and we got a link for you in the comments there. So if you missed anything Chris said in that video... Um, check out that uh, link all about emerald ash borer. Um, let's see. Teresa asked earlier, uh, help. I have Japanese beetles. What do I do? So that's a great topic, I think, to touch on today because they have arrived. Uh, luckily, I have not seen any in my garden. My fingers keeping my fingers. They're, they're, 
And Same here. So, they haven't got me yet. Yeah. So I'm going to keep hoping that stays that way, but I know it won't. Uh, so, um, Kelly, do you want to maybe give some uh, tips on Japanese beetles? Yeah. Um, Japanese beetles are super variable throughout the state. I mean, you know, just in the three counties that I serve as a horticulture educator, it's variable from year to year. And even across those counties, it can be super variable. So um, some of you may not have that big of a pressure and some of you, it just, they just may ascend from the clouds. I don't know <laughs> what is going on, but yeah, um, I feel like Japanese, the secret to Japanese beetles is to really get them in the first couple of weeks mm -hmm. because what they're doing is they're going around and they're feeding on plants and they find a plant that they really like, like your roses or your basil or your raspberries, and they leave behind this feeding hormone with this lacy foliage. And we leave that on the plant and it is a, a beacon for the rest of the Japanese beetles. So, I mean, you know, uh, it can be, you know, like, you know, to go and pinch all that lacy foliage, you can almost be completely defoliating your plant, depending on what plant it is. But I feel like, you know, getting them early and not letting them get super infested is the secret. Um, allowing some damage, I mean, it's, you're not going to not have a Japanese beetle, especially if it's a susceptible plant. I mean, sometimes people will put netting over it, the um, uh, uh, um, Candace. What are you What's talking about? Word? Row cover, the row oh, cover okay. netting. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, where are you getting that? <laughs> can, you, did you guys know that Candace can tell me what my words are sometimes? I try. <laughs> um, uh, and so that can help a little bit, you know, uh, you know, but, you know, if I had like uh, Japanese beetles attack my basil now, I'd probably, you know, uh, pinch off those leaves and replant later. Mm -hmm. um, there, there is um, some stuff out there. Um, I just looked it up. Um, go ahead, have, have Ryan tell you some of the things he does for Japanese beetles. But I did find an organic Japanese beetle a chemical in our book, and I wanted to um, make sure okay. I said the right one. Cool. You know, and, that's, I feel, and that's, I feel like, important. Sorry, Ryan. I'll, um, I feel like that's important because a lot, there, of course, are pesticides that are recommended for Japanese beetles. There's numerous ones of them out there. But what you have to be careful, of course, is any other type of insect that you're also targeting with those same pesticides, so pollinators. Um, for example, so you kind of have to weigh your options in terms of how you're gonna uh, gonna control those. Yeah, I was just gonna say that. I mean, a, a lot of times I'm not really controlling much. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, I I do try and kind of walk around and like Kelly said early on with my little bucket of soap, kind of knock a few off, and just especially when they're keying in on the, you know, the raspberries, the blackberries are kind of the things that are hitting at my house a lot that I worry about, but, um, you know, for a lot of ornamental plants they get on, I've got like a, a an ornamental hazelnut that they like to chew around on. Like I, I really am just kind of letting them do their thing on that plant because I don't want them on my raspberries and other things. So mm -hmm. I think for me, it's kind of selective and where I really try and pressure them to not go after those plants. But, um, you know, ultimately a lot of that damage really for a woody plant it's not going to kill the plant most times. It, yeah. I just, I worry about some of the smaller shrubs or some of those things like, like again, a raspberry where I'm worried about production on that plant. I want it to be as healthy as possible to put as many berries out next year. And so I'm worried that I'm losing some photosynthesis to those skeletonized leaves. And that's the reason why I start to initiate control. But Kelly, I think it's a really great um, example of kind of an IPM approach to things where mm -hmm. it's not just taking out seven and spraying it all over the place to control these. There's just lots of different ways you can do it from, you know, that initial control to exposure with row covers. That's, that's probably the best thing I've done with some of my berry shrubs is just completely covering it up and keeping them out. So, or do what I do and take down crab apples because you don't want the Japanese beetles. 
And, and I think that's no. kind of been my strategy in my garden too, is that I just don't plant a lot of things that are super magnets to Japanese beetle. Mm-hmm. Like I don't plant roses. I don't even plant sweet potato vine anymore. Cause it's just like a magnet to, there's just certain things that they just really love. And I found that to be kind of helpful to, for the sake of the rest of my plants. Yeah. I think that's a great point. That plant that they're keying on just, it, it maybe is a good science, a bad one for your garden place. And I know, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mentioned that hazelnut I've got. It's an ornamental corkscrew purple leaf, tape, you know, cool looking hazelnut. I just had no idea before I got it. Yeah. <laughs> that it would well, be it, a favorite. Is it the lindens? The, is it the lindens that they love? Yeah. Linden. Yeah, no, they really I like would lindens. Just, yeah, I would just not plant them. As much as I love lindens, I just would not plant one in my yard. Well, I don't think you can find them in the industry. Really? Because of the Japanese beetles. Yeah. I mean, it is sad for the raspberries. That's where I feel like is like the food production because they they can really yeah. get on some, um, you know, even some apple trees. I've had orchardists, um, you know, be like, oh, the Japanese beetles are so bad. And so uh, sometimes they use that kaolin clay. Have you guys heard of that? Uh-huh. Sort of an OMRI certified thing. It kind of puts this like kind of this, you know, a uh, surfactant yeah. on everything. So it kind of covers the leaves and covers the fruits and, um, you know, prevents, you know, prevents them from that way. Another thing in here that um, is, it's the Bacillus thuringiensis galleria. And so it's, it's, it's not the BT that kills the, the caterpillars. It is one that is specific for, um, working with beetles, but so, um, like Ryan said, you don't want to just go in there and find a chemical that says that it'll kill beetles because what ultimately you're going to kill is you're going to kill all these beneficial insects and these pollinators that we're really trying to conserve right now. Mm -hmm. Um, they're everywhere. Um, so you going out and killing, um, Japanese beetles, you're actually, you know, really, um, um, depleting, you know, all those, uh, the ecological part of your garden. So, uh, but there's nothing like a good Japanese beetle outbreak to get people to start spraying chemicals and start Mm -hmm. killing bees. So at this point, we would much rather you allow those Japanese beetles to completely decimate a plant rather than spray chemicals on them, unless you use one of these organic ones. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Japanese, I mean, for a For instance, we have um, a historical garden here called Sarah's Garden. It has beautiful heirloom roses. Are we going to tell them that they can't grow roses? Well, of course not. They have to grow those beautiful heirloom roses that Sarah grew back in the 1860s, right? Yeah. So they're just in that garden every single day, just popping those Uh, in the morning when they're lethargic and just popping them into soapy water and they just do that every day, every morning. Yeah. So So I think, I think another question that comes up a lot on this topic is the use of traps. So would you mind kind of talking about that Kelly for a minute? Yeah. Um, Yeah. Um, I, I, speaking of working in the industry, you know, I remember working in the industry and, um, uh, I walked up to uh, a different uh, place, a different garden center, and they were selling beetle traps. And I said, why are you selling beetle traps? They are proven not to work. And they're like, well, people just keep asking for them. And we've actually printed the article from U of I Extension that says the beetle traps do not work effectively and put it next to the beetle traps and they still by the beetle traps. Yeah. And so that it just it, it, kind of crazy. I can sit here and I can tell you over and over, you guys, yes, you're going to get a lot of beetles in that trap, but you're you're kind of luring them to your property. You're, you, you want to do the exact opposite. You want them to stay away from your property. Mm-hmm. You don't want them to be anywhere near your property. So um, it's really um, not a not a great idea. Um, you know, I mean, I'll have people come back. I mean, even if it's a big property, even if I did blah, 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 this, I'm just like, well, all I can say is that the research has shown that it's not helpful at all. So don't 
don't do those. Um, but yeah. yeah, I think you, so. Your best bet is just to not be attractive early in the season, and hopefully, those other lindens in your neighborhood, those other raspberry plants or rose shrubs, they accumulate on, and then you're they're all off somewhere else for the rest of the. What yeah. what are they out for? About a month. A little more than yeah, a month. Six so. weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So you just have to weather the storm. Yeah. Um, okay. We had a follow up question from Tiffany. Um, does Extension have a list of plants uh, that they discourage for Japanese beetles? Um, and then also, is that the standard BT for the Japanese um, beetles? And you said it's not standard BT, right, Kelly? It's BT it's with GBTG. So it's, I mean, you're going to look at the active ingredient on the back of the chemical. For instance, you guys, you, let's go, let's say you're going up to it and it says that it's beetle kill. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the active ingredient um, on that and I'm going to see, and if it says Bacillus thuringiensis galleria, then I know I have the right thing. Yeah. But if it says carbaryl or organophosphate, those are um, the ones that we don't, we're, we're trying to encourage you not to use because they do kill the bees. Does that explain it well enough? Yeah, I mm -hmm. think that's perfect. And then you and then, always read the directions on that, right? If it says yeah. do not spray during, you know, um, even the ones that do kill bees, they may tell you not to spray when bees are active. And so you have to follow that. So even if it were an organic and it's not going to ultimately kill all the bees, I still wouldn't actively spray it on a bee. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Follow the label. Yeah. <laughs> it might um, kill that bee, but <laughs> if it would only be one, so. Yeah. And then in terms of a list of uh, plants, I don't know that we have, maybe somebody has a good blog post on that, but if not, I would just type into Google Tiffany and put in um, plants that Japanese beetles love and then just add extension to your search as well. And if we don't have one from Illinois, you should there should be some that'll pop up from other states that would have, uh, look for some other Midwestern states and see what's out yeah, there. Yeah, I would think of Purdue or something. Somebody I'm sure has one, yeah. Okay, let's see. Follow up question from uh, Jean earlier. The common name of that shrub that Amanda was obsessed with was a uh, Diablo nine bark. So the nine bark is the common name of the shrub, and the cultivar in particular is Diablo, which kind of has that darker uh, foliage that she was talking about. Um, let's see. Comment from Laurel. So she started Mountain Mint this year as well. It's still small, but not a ton of pollinators yet, but they will come. I will note on Mountain Mint, be careful if you do ever cut it or harvest it or anything like that. It is a skin irritant. Uh, if I remember, it's phytotoxic. So if you get the sap on your skin, mm -hmm. um, people will have reactions. So actually a lot of us flower farmers, we don't grow it anymore because people would put it in bouquets and then people would get it on their skin and it was just never a, a good thing. So if you're leaving it in the garden, great. Pollinators will, will love it. Just be careful of that. Um, and then Laurel also mentioned after, so for my last show, she had the mosquito traps, electronic mosquito traps. And she said, uh, although I didn't actually open them to do a head count, they appeared to be full of small moths. So she ditched both of them. So good job. Good to know, Laurel. Good work. <laughs> um, okay, let's see some other questions here. Um, Teresa asked this year I planted my pots with perennials in the center and annuals surrounding them. Uh, that said, can I plant them in the ground in the fall or do I bring them in? And she said penstemon, for example. So yeah, I typically will plant mine in the ground about September uh, or so. I have a pot on my front porch right now that has some hookah in it and some perennial ferns. So yeah, about uh, early September, mid-September, I will pull those out, plant them in the ground, and then hopefully have them survive as uh, perennials then. If you have a large enough pot with a big enough soil mass and you can put it in a protected site, you might be able to overwinter them in the container. Uh, but for me, I usually just go ahead and move them, move them to the ground. Would you guys agree on that? Yeah. The only, uh, only thing I might add is just with woody plants, I've always for years kind of buried them in a big giant pile of mulch. And I've done that with perennials and pots as well. And that just kind of helps insulate the, 
the pot a little bit more so you can't have, so it doesn't freeze into an ice cube solid ice cube but uh, nice. yeah so there's ways you can overwinter as cool. well hopefully that helps yeah the candace do you remember in college we were taught that you can plant a plant anytime the ground is unfrozen mm, true However, there are some exceptions. Yeah. Ideally, it's really not <laughs> ideal. Really thought that. But <laughs> if you, it, it just, it, basically the whole thing was, if you give good plant care, it's going to survive. Mm -hmm. um, so if you, you know, water it in before the winter, you know, again, those rules, the exception is we're fixing, we're going to be bombarded with chrysanthemums in the, in the future. And some of those, when you plant them in, August and September can do not overwinter well. Yeah, yeah. So that's one of the exceptions. But you can always, you know, plant those asters or those solidagos that you buy in the store. Mm -hmm. And Candace will probably be going to the store in the fall to buy perennials, right? Heck yeah, especially when they get on sale. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I think that's how I've pushed the limits the most in my gardening is buying all that on sale stuff yeah, and seeing yeah. if it works, you know, <laughs> exactly. the trees in July. I mean, you I figure you I'm not out much if I lose it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, Amanda kept saying, I noticed this in the industry too, you know, it seemed like we get this like huge rush of, you know, this huge rush of customers in the spring. And then throughout the summer, I would be growing some pretty amazing stuff, some gorgeous new baskets, or I'd do some sunflower projects or marigolds, you know, to try to entice people to buy some more when they're Thing. And so they kind of miss out on some of those later planting. And so this idea that, you know, gardening is done by May and you can't do anything after that just dumbfounds me all yeah. the time. Yeah. Because I mean, we're I still gardening. Oh, yeah. Especially for perennials. I plant perennials all season long. Usually I'm too busy in the spring to get a whole bunch of it done. So most of mine get planted in the summer and fall just because that's when I have time. And the yes, vegetables, you know, Ryan and I will, um, you know, we'll, st we'll, you know, let we'll go back to those vegetables that we grew in the spring, and we'll do another crop in the fall. Mm -hmm. um, so, just because you know we're getting to the point where you know it's getting a little hot, and it doesn't mean we've stopped gardening at all. Yeah. Well, I also, I also feel kind of like obligated to cruise through the garden center every once in a while and just make sure I'm not missing out on that cool thing that came right. in. Yeah. You know, or or just like you all noticed noted the uh, purple leaf ZZ plant that was floating mm -hmm. around at some stores last time. I had to go check that out and make sure I didn't miss out on some of those. Oh, did, did you, you find one? it? Did you get one? Uh, you know, interestingly, I found it in Southern Illinois. It was not right. available in Champaign-Urbana. By the time I heard it from you guys, it was too late. <laughs> and then uh, just last, earlier this week, I was down in Southern Illinois and uh, stuff, actually in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. And nice. nobody had bought a single plant out of their display. Like they were, I mean, there's just a ton of them there where, yeah. so it's kind of weird. Maybe, uh, where must have got out in central Illinois? Then. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the what dark I said. I, plants are in. <laughs> they are. I saw it in a local plant Facebook group. They're like, hey, they have these in stock. And then everybody runs and get it. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm still going to garden centers right now. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, I haven't stopped. Um, Same here. You know, buying, I meant, you know, uh, Again, I do a lot of buying for work, but uh, now I'm like, oh, I just need more collar. <laughs> well, you know, or, or you just need like one little thing. So you got to stop by there. And I just, I got to walk through all the plants. I can't yeah. not, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, but, but it is interesting. She has a really good point. There's definitely different things, you know, this time of year, you're going to find that in that spring rush, or I think sometimes it's just, there's so many things there. Like my attention span is not good enough to see them all. Yeah, you know, in May, so it, maybe you don't see them until their things are cleared out a little bit right now. Overwhelming, yeah. Okay, we've got the question. Maybe you'll know this one, Ryan. Deb asks, um, "How extensive are jumping worms in Champaign County right now? And if people see them, is there a place they should report that to?" Uh, well, yeah. there's actually been a couple good blog posts about jumping worms this spring that have came mm -hmm. through Extension. I know Chris Evans wrote one. Kelly, did you write one? I'm trying to think. I know there's been a few that have kind of updated us on the status. I think Champaign County is already on the map of reported locations. 
Um, so I don't know that it's super, um, you know, urgent that you report that because it won't be necessarily a new county getting populated on the map. But I think it's also a good idea that we note those uh, newer populations. So if you're in a county that's not filled in on the map, I think that's pretty important. But um, I think, and Kelly, you can probably talk about this too, but I think the story we've kind of learned is that there are there are a lot more prevalent out there than what our map even shows, um, sadly. So, um, so anyway, I don't, I, would you have anything to add to that answer, Kelly? Since kind of I mean, answer. yeah, I think they still want them to turn it into the plant clinic. Um, it's not going to cost you anything and you can get it or, you know, for instance, we just identified it here in Bloomington and we took a picture and we just uh, both the uh, horticulture educators were like, yeah, we think it is, but we want to go ahead and make sure. So we went ahead and had um, Chris Evans um, identify that for us. But um, I still think we're tracking it, but I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not saying necessarily don't don't report. I think it's wor definitely worth noting and reporting. Mm -hmm. And the plant clinic would be that. I'm feeling, I'm feeling like we need to take that. You know, we're we're not. I, I feel like it's already here. I feel like you know yeah. what what it is is they're telling us you know it's preventative, preventative, preventative. So think about how things are coming into your garden, and be very careful with what comes into your garden. And it, that is the best piece of advice that I think extension can do for you right now. I mean, um, pasteurized soil, pasteurized um, amendments, um, you know, uh, uh, no, no plant sharing, um, cleaning of tools, uh, you know, those were watch out where your mulch comes from. Um, those can be really, um, I think that is the secret to um, making sure that you don't get jumping mulches to find all the sources right now. Yeah. But yeah. I, don't know. I mean, you know, it's like extension says once you get jumping worms, there's nothing you can do about it. And the IPM girl in me says, uh, really? That's the answer you're going to give me? I would like a better answer than that. <laughs> but is there one? No, I think extension yeah. says that because yeah. there's not one. So we yeah. just need to think about, you know, what happens when we do get jumping worm? Uh, how do we mitigate our damage? How, you know, so prevention is key. We found it, it, it had already been in Bloomington. But I don't think uh, people are as aware of it as they should be here in Bloomington. Um, I've done a little bit of scouting, but there we have confirmed another one at a very large public garden so, this week. So, yeah. So, our, really, our goal as gardeners should be to slow or stop the spread. So, you know, if you have them then you really need to be careful with anything leaving your property that has soil attached to it, whether it's a plant or mm -hmm. a bucket full of soil for whatever reason you might be moving around. And, and so to me, the, the bigger problem in this, the, the big picture of all this is, is these jumping worms getting into all of our natural areas where it's not something we want in our yard or our garden space, but there are some things we can do to overcome jumping worms in our home setting. We can fertilize, we can, Add more nutrient, add more organic matter to the soil. To, you know what what those jumping worms do is massively consume that organic matter. That in a forested setting is is the nutrient return into that soil. So it it changes the um, you know the soil environment in a natural ecosystem, and that's what we're trying to stop is or, or limit is to spread into these natural areas. Again, not to say it's, you want them in your yard by any means, but it's just it, in a smaller space in your yard and your landscaping, we can actually focus on some management or some mitigation where, you know, an entire nature preserve or forest preserve district, there's just not much they're going to be able to do. So those are kind of the key, the key things is just limiting that spread in any way we can. And Kelly had a great list there, ways to limit. Yeah, sometimes I think that we missed the message. Why should you care about mm -hmm. jumping worms? Why did, should Candace care? Candace should care about jumping worms because they are going to potentially um, uh, harm her 
landscape beds. Yeah, uh, she, my she, soil structure. Yeah. Her soil mm -hmm. is, you know, uh, she might have to start, you know, doing soil reclamation or she might have to start growing all in raised beds, which would um, mess up her business, right? She's growing some cut flowers and, yeah, um, pain. <laughs> you know, she has all these perennial beds. And so, all those perennial beds are not going to look as good and not going to be as uh, floriferous. Mm -hmm. Everybody, everybody rolls their eyes at me when I say floriferous. Mm -hmm. It's a good word though. Which means all those beautiful flowers that Candace has. So you're just not going to be, you're, you're not going to be as good of a gardener because you're not going to have what you need. What's yeah. so amazing about Illinois is that we have these amazing soils for Candace to grow all this stuff in, and now we're going to have these jumping worms come in and deplete everything amazing about that soil. So it's going to be much harder on Candace to grow those perennials. It's much harder on Ryan to grow those those vegetables for um, him if he's having to constantly worry about soil structure and soil fertility. And so, um, you know, it, it's, it's kind of sad. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah. another yeah, level of beautiful soil, and now these jumping worms are going to come and mess with it. So yeah, but at, at the ecosystem scale, at the natural area scale, that's that's a different thing to think about too. Because um, again, there, there's not much we can do. We can intensively manage our home garden spaces and try and overcome this, but um, I mean, it's it's a change in biodiversity at the ecosystem scale that is at stake. So that's and, and that's there's not a way to really deal with that. You know, a change in plant communities is a result um, and losing some of the more sensitive plants. Yeah. And when you think about the forest and all that organic matter that kind of accumulates and underneath those forest trees, how much lives within that just that little layer of organic matter of leaves and old plants, you know, so many insects and um, you know, animals and just bacteria and fungi and all that is no longer going to have a place to live if that organic matter is not layered on top of the forest floor. Yeah. It is super sad. Yes. If it, it could be potentially dangerous. So the best thing that we can do is, you know, stop the spread and take it seriously. Um, and, um, you know, you're a gardener. Don't share your plants. Don't take any other buddy's plants. You know, you really take it seriously. Yeah. With the we had a uh, question here over on YouTube. They asked for cleaning of tools to prevent jumping worms when working at multiple sites. Is it enough to just wipe off the dirt with a towel? I personally think it's enough, but I'm going to say no, it's not enough. I would say use alcohol. Because your risk, um, your risk I, don't, yeah, I don't know exactly what is enough. So yeah. let's go for the alcohol. And, um, you know, I was thinking about not letting people share tools, but you think about these master gardeners that are trying to go to these public gardens where there's not a tool, a set of tools there for them to even work with. So I just instructed my master gardeners to use alcohol. Mm -hmm. Probably just, just to be safe. Net. But do I think alcohol? I don't know. Well, and I, I would don't know. I don't of, know where the it, it, have yeah. the egg cases all um, emerged. Do they yeah. overwinter? I don't know. Yeah, I know yeah. nothing. Rin I would think rinsing off bucket of water, really swirl it around. Al yeah, I think it would all help. Definitely. Um, okay, we've got about five minutes left. So if you have any final questions, get them in. We've got a couple more here. Um, Lisa asked, she has the uh, Physococcus opulifolius, the Diablo, which is the nine bark we've been talking about. Uh, this is the first year that she's had mildew on it. How do I know if it's a powdery mildew or a downy and do I treat? So I would say more than likely it is powdery mildew, which is very common on nine bark. Uh, powdery mildew, you're going to have that white uh, powdery growth on the typically the upper surface of the leaves. Downy mildew, you're typically going to have more of a grayish fuzzy growth on the underside of the leaves, usually where that starts. Um, to be honest, I never treat mine for powdery mildew. If I do have a problem, I will usually cut back those particular stems that, that are having a lot of that powdery mildew. And that obviously removes some of it, but it also helps increase your airflow. If you have a very dense 
nine bark with not a lot of air movement, um, that tends to uh, give you a little bit more incidence. But that's that's me. That's what I would do. Insecticidal soap will kill the powdery mildew. It's never going to cure it, though. I mean, if, yeah, you have, and if you have a leaf with powdery mildew and I spray insecticidal soap on that leaf, that whole powdery mildew spot is going to be now necrotic, dead stuff. Yeah. So you're probably going to go back and prune it out anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's just kind of part of having the nine bark. They're they're known to have some powdery mildew issues. So depending on the weather, it's and happened. maybe next year um, thin it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I've always dealt with that with just pruning, mm -hmm. just like you suggested. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Teresa asked, what is the best mulch to use? So that's a broad question. And for me, a lot of it is personal preference, I would say. It's usually what I talk about when we talk about mulch. I prefer a hardwood, just chipped mulch on most of of my beds. Uh, but it also depends what you're mulching too. In your vegetable garden, you guys are probably going to use something a little lighter than that. Something that's going to break down a little faster, right? Yeah. We usually use straw in vegetable gardens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I've used a little wood chips in the vegetable gardens really light just because I had a bunch of it. But, um, you know, my preference for landscape plants is, yeah, a whole tree kind of mulch, you know, that is basically the, an entire tree that was chipped up and is made into mulch and has been kind of let sit for a little while. And that's because it has all the different plant parts ground up in there. So the leaves that have a lot of nutrient content are in there, are decomposing. So it's giving the most back to my soil, just kind of mimicking that forest environment where um, the thing that you see a lot are some bark mulches, which are a little different because they, they don't have all those other materials in there. It's just bark. And if you think about what bark does on a tree trunk, it's pretty rot resistant. That's like its main main goal. So the nice thing about, I guess, bark mulch is that it lasts a while. It'll last longer, but mm -hmm. I don't feel like you get, you know, it's it's you don't get as much stuff going back in the soil. You're not mimicking that, you know, uh, the the, for, the layer in the forest Kelly was talking about that decomposition layer. You're not getting as much uh, nutrient input and and just other good things with it. So, okay, cool. I don't love mulch. <laughs> well, I will. I will. I will tell you. So, uh, us here in Bloomington, we got about ten inches in like a two-day period. So, a lot of my mulch uh, mm -hmm. washed away to places where it was not intended mm -hmm. to be. Uh, now, obviously, that it was a very unique rain again event that typically does not happen. Um, so I will probably remulch a couple of my areas, but in general, my planting policy is to try to fill an area with plants as much as possible so that the ground is covered and I really don't mm -hmm. need to, to mulch. So that's why I'm always kind of filling in with more and more perennials until I can basically kind of have plant material as the, the cover for that area so that hopefully I don't have to mulch as much. I mean, like, you know, like like using, I don't know, I love the idea of using plants as mulch. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if you need it's a little easier. mulch on the edge or right here to keep yeah. something in place, do a little ground cover or, um, you know, you need some, you know, we're, Ryan, I'm sure uh, it may he may not do it on a regular basis, but I'm sure he's thought about experimenting with the clover mulch for the vegetable gardens. Just... Mm -hmm. Just, you know, I mean, I don't know. I just, you know, I, the Roy Diblick book just did it for me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Kelly Kelly does not need to read books because <laughs> she, she reads these gardening books and then she starts worshiping these people. But Roy Diblick, he just had this like really cool, you know, just this idea of why do we use mulch quite so much? We kind of like you know, set our plants up for failure. It, his whole idea is to do what Candace is doing, where we really knit the plants together, where we stop this, you know, this sea of mulch. Um, plus, you know, mulch, you know, uh, we, we don't want to always be um, using all this mulch anyway. I don't know. I just think there are certain 
ways to use it and certain ways to not. We just like got it. We've gotten a little mulch crazy Mm -hmm. in our gardening style as of late. Personally, that's just me. I go to, you know, hospitals and businesses and it's just like green plant, sea of mulch, green plant, sea of mulch. I see why they did it. They don't want to deal with weeds, but it's just ugly. But, you know, I view areas areas of open mulch, though, are high-maintenance areas, if you ask me, because that's where I'm spending my time weeding in my own garden, yeah. where I have a lot. I've got some newer plantings that have a lot of mulch right now because things haven't filled in. So, yeah, I, I tend to mulch heavily at the start and then hopefully get that nice canopy of plants in place that Can- Candace is talking about and have, have the plants do the work. Yeah, yeah. it's... Large areas of mulch are bad. I mean, I guess the, the worst, most offensive places I have on my property are probably little mulch paths yeah, to go yeah. through things where, gosh, yeah, that yeah. path is just a problem. Yeah. So I'm trying to go away from those kind of things in your areas. But. Okay, we've got one final question before we end today. Um, Tiffany Kamash said, in a recent um, storm, I lost a large portion of my river birch, which was roughly 20 years old. It broke off about halfway down the branch with several other offshoots coming off of it still being okay. The tree's company says I can salvage the rest of the branch, but I don't want to end up causing more problems. What are your thoughts? Um, Well, I think it's, it's good. You had somebody out on the ground to take a look at it and repair, you know, you need to repair the damage. So by that, I mean, you know, probably any hanging limbs have fallen out. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, obviously anything that's dangerous and precarious and hanging, we need to get out. But I think what people miss a lot is then there's a lot of branch stubs left in there. So broken off spots that weren't, that don't, that need a proper pruning cut back to a branch union. So that's, that's the two major points, you know, get the stuff that's broken out of there or is splintered and still kind of in the tree and then get proper pruning cuts made back on all those spots. Um, as far as making that determination of, you know, how much of this limb is damaged and is it savable and all those things. I think the one thing you have going for you in your favor is that it's a young river birch. So they're very vigorously growing. It's probably a pretty, assuming it's a pretty healthy tree. Mm -hmm. Um, So usually my rule of thumb is if you lose more than a third of that branch, that half of the tree, you know, and, and kind of pick yeah, you, I, a third of the tree would be another number, but if you're looking at, I'm picturing a multi-stemmed river birch where if I've lost more than a third of one of those uh, main stems, then I start to think about whether I can keep that or not. Um, again, you've got a younger, healthier tree, so I'd probably push that a little bit, but you know, to for me, if, if I've lost like half that stem, I think I'm thinking about pruning it down to the base or replacing that plant as opposed to dealing with half of a, a stem that had, you know, all those wounds yeah. there have to seal over and can have some rot and other issues down the road. Yeah. So. Cool. Well, hopefully that helps Tiffany. Um, awesome. Well, we want to thank everybody for joining us today. We had a killer round of questions. Really appreciated that. And Amanda was really interesting. So if you joined late, uh, after this live ends, you can go back and rewatch the beginning uh, right there on our Facebook page if you missed it. So we will be back in two weeks on July 15th. We're going to be talking all about gardening, maintenance, watering, all that kind of stuff with our another horticulture, horticulture educator, Jennifer Fishburn. So we're excited for that. So thanks, everybody, for joining us. We will see you in two weeks. Happy gardening.